Hey folks, uh, we have an interesting session today. Today's session is meant for three types of candidates. Uh, a, uh, it's useful for FRM part two, specifically in your credit risk. There's a reading called credit risk and credit derivative. So we'll be doing at we'll be looking at first couple of learning outcomes from that particular reading. This session will also be useful for CFA level two candidates. Uh, in your fixed income syllabus, you have uh, introduction to Merton model. If you're interested in learning that model in depth, you'll find today's session very helpful. Today's session will also help CFA level two candidates learning the Black and Scholes model in the derivative syllabus. And third, this session will also be helpful for anyone who in general is willing to learn uh, the BSM option pricing formula. How to put that formula in Microsoft Excel, how to create a, uh, how to create some sort of a framework uh, based on the formula and uh, how that formula could also be applied in a credit risk environment. All right, so with this background, we're going to get started. Here's the agenda for the session. Uh, we'll first look at a, a general discussion on bank's business model and how, how does the credit risk arise, how to value or how to evaluate the credit risk. Then we'll go to the BSM model for calls and put. We'll do an example. Then we'll take the same example. We'll solve it first step by step. Then we'll put that in the Microsoft Excel framework. We'll create a nice formula out of it. And then we'll uh, be able to repurpose that formula in multiple situation. Then we'll take the same BSM formula, apply that in a credit risk framework. So we'll go to something called as the Merton model. Uh, and we'll use that for equity valuation. Then we'll take the same Merton model and then we'll use it for debt valuation. And there are two methods which are being proposed, uh, both based on derivatives. And we'll look at the two different approaches of reaching to the same conclusion. All right, so that's the agenda. And with this background, let us get started. It's going to be fun uh, session in general. It is also going to be numeric, numerically intensive and conceptually intensive. All right, so the first discussion understanding how does a uh, bank's business model works and how does the credit risk evaluation uh, what are the credit risk evaluation options all right so look at it this way let's say we're looking at a uh, you know looking at a simplistic bank's balance sheet okay so let's say this is this is a bank's balance sheet let's create a bank's balance sheet here now bank is getting money through variety of sources, deposits and you know equity and all of it. So there's the equity liability side. What we are focused today is on the asset side, all right? So bank is getting money into the business and then that money is deployed at different sources. So primarily there are two areas where the money gets deployed. Big chunk of that money is given again in the form of variety of different loans, either retail loans or business loans or corporate loans. And then some part of that money is also deployed into investments, right? And on this asset side, now variety of risk would emerge. So what is the risk with investment that you've deployed money into, let's say bonds or equities, the value of this bonds or equities would fall. How would you measure that risk? So we can use let's say metrics like value at risk, correct? And this area primarily falls under market risk. So that's not for up for a discussion today. But obviously if you're FRM candidate and if you've seen the market risk videos uh, of FRM part two, you have good idea of how this works. The area of focus for today's session is these loans here. Now these loans which banks uh, have given when you give these loans in turn you give you get exposed to the credit risk and in a very simple language how do you want to think of credit risk the risk that the risk that whatever money that's owed to you will not be paid on time or will not be paid at all right that's your credit risk so then the question comes how do I evaluate this credit risk right what are the different options which are available so in the context of this particular reading, if you want to evaluate, if you want to evaluate, let's say a single loan, right? You've given a single corporate loan and you want to do some sort of a risk evaluation on the credit risk front. Then the model that we would be looking at would be the Merton model. This model could be used for valuation of equity, valuation of debt. It could also be used for estimating probability of default 
and the loss given default okay so if you if there's a single loan we have mental model but what if you want to do your credit risk evaluation on a portfolio of loans on a portfolio of loans then we have a few techniques uh, then we have a few techniques one particular technique is uh, you know the J the technique developed by jp morgan we have another technique called the risk matrix right so credit matrix or risk matrix these are some of the options which are available for portfolio of loan evaluation so again that bank is originating loans loans are giving us credit risk we want to evaluate the credit risk if i want to do it for a single borrower i'm looking at a melton model if i want to do a portfolio i'm looking at different options now the focus of today's session is here right what we're going to look at today is the melton model and that's your background and this is your perspective and this is the reason why you're learning this all right so i hope that that makes sense to you now once this is out of our way and then we'll go to the point number 2 of our agenda where we'll introduce ourselves to the the BSM model all right so so let's go to the BSM model now it's an option pricing model it can be applied on european options so let's first get the let's first get the formula out of our way so we're looking at the b s m model here now with the help of b s m model you can value call options or you can value a put option as well okay and the first thing that i'm going to do is i'm going to lay out the formula by the way bsm model was built in 1973 right the m in the bsm model stands for metton so after this formula was originally published in 1974 another formula was published by the merton of bsm where what he did is he took the same formula but he applied that for equity valuation purposes so bsm is actually a option pricing formula and we would be learning today that how an option pricing formula could actually be applied in a equity valuation context right so the merton model was introduced merton model was introduced in 1974 so that is the logical sequence through which we want to learn this that is a logical sequence through which we want to learn this material all right okay so let's look at the look at the bsm formula first so a call option could be valued as the spot price of the underlying asset multiplied with n d1 n basically is is hinting towards the normal distribution d1 is we'll see how to calculate in fact that's the only complex or slightly complex part of the formula minus the strike price okay denoted by x we take a present value of that so we say multiplied with e raised to rt and again if you're doing this for the first time this is going to look a little overwhelming but once you solve a couple of questions you realize it's a fairly easy formula to master okay it's not that difficult it just requires a little bit of practice so strike price into e raised to rt multiplied with n d2 again d2 to be calculated and then we take a the the area under the curve using the normal distribution all right so that's your formula for a call option so if you would see getting spot is very simple that's not a challenge right getting the present value of strike price is also not the challenge so what we really need to work on is getting the value of nd1 and nd2 all right now let's start looking at the values of how do you get the value of d1 not nd1 the value of d1 so we calculate d1 and then we go to normal distribution and then we try to fetch the n d1 value so let's look at d1 so d1 would be calculated like this you would say log normal of natural log of the ratio of spot price and the strike price right this term in the formula gives you a sense of the distance between the spot and strike now as you guys are aware that uh, in a call option higher the strike price higher the spot price uh compared to strike the more call option is in the money correct so if you think of it this is nothing but the distance between the two numbers strike and spot 
right and then we take a natural log of that value now plus plus half of variance half of variance so variance is sigma square so half of variance adjusted for time period so if you have an annual variance and if you're doing a three year option you multiply with three if you're doing a six month option you multiply it with 0.5 right plus plus risk free rate of return so there is a concept of risk neutrality that we bring in uh, but again we'll not get into technicalities but just look at the formula first so risk free rate of return again adjusted for the time period right and there is a reason why i've written these terms individually because as we'll progress in this particular video i'll look i'll show you some of the modifications in the formula as well where we don't make use of this uh, risk free rate of return okay so this is the first part so oh, this is the numerator of course this numerator needs to be scaled by a number so in the denominator what we have is we have a sigma multiplied with root t sigma multiplied with root t so this is how you calculate d1 now do i put the d1 directly in the formula no once i have the d1 i go to the normal distribution tables and then i figure out something called this nd1 i'll show you it's not difficult right now let's do d2 d2 so how do you get d2 you would say d1 so you take this value here minus the denominator sigma into root t sigma into root t all right so that's how you get d1 d2 and then you get your nd1 and nd2 there now obviously uh, one question that you know is very popular with some of these exams and you should be aware of this is what is the meaning of nd1 and nd2 in black and scholes right what what do they really mean so so the way you want to think of nd1 is nd1 is simply simply the delta of the call option okay if you know what it means good news but if you don't i'll be showing it to you with the help of an example with the live demonstration right so this is the delta of the call option delta of the call option delta of call option all right so the formula is set up for us let's revise the formula one more time so you feel comfortable with it call is equal to spot into nd1 minus x into e raised to r t negative right so this indicates taking the present value so this part is the present value uh, at times we simply call this as the present value of the bond and you would understand why also very soon so this into nd2 that's it now how do you get d1 so in your numerator is made of three parts first the natural log of distance between spot and strike half of variance adjusted for time rfr adjusted for time and denominator is made of sigma into root t d2 is d1 minus sigma into root t now if you are a cfl level 2 or frm part 2 candidate i'll strongly suggest you to kind of try and memorize this formula practice a few questions so that even if even if you don't get a direct in fact in frm part 2 i think there could be a direct formula based question especially in the merton context but in cfl level 2 even if you get some uh, you know intuitive question if you know the formula you would still be able to solve all right so that's the formula now let's do an example let's see if you know we can put this in put this in practice so i'm going to kind of set up a illustration for you let's say uh, let's say we are trying to value option it's an european option so let's do a call call european european means to be exercised only on on the expiry let's keep strike price as 100 let's keep spot price as as let's keep it as 140 let's keep sigma as 30 percentage risk free rate of return as 10 percentage and let's keep maturity of uh, let's keep maturity or expiry of let us say uh, let us say half a year okay 0.5 years or six months so this is the data and if i have this much of information i can use the formula that we've just built here and i can try and value the call option all right so first we'll set up we'll set up the equation for the equation for the call option so let's let's do the equation here so call option is equal to call option is equal to spot price 
what is my spot price 140 multiplied with n d1 n d1 we'll have to calculate that minus minus the present value of the strike strike is 100 so we'll say 100 multiplied with e raised to minus what's the r here r we are looking at 10 percentage correct what's the rt that 10 percentage needs to be scaled for the time period so that's half of the year six months right so that's half of the year into 0.5 so this is your present value of strike price now this we need to multiply with n d2 all right so that's your equation so now the only thing that's left for us is to figure out what would be the value of d1 what would be the value of d2 and then we get nd1 nd2 job done all right so let's do nd1 so d1 is equal to natural log of natural log of the distance between the spot and the strike so distance between the spot and the strike would be 140 divided by 100 correct spot divided by strike 140 divided by 100 plus we'll take the variance 30 percentage sorry this is a standard deviation when I square it I get the variance divide this with divide this with this with 2 because we want to take half of it so 30 percentage square divided by 2 obviously we'll have to do a time period adjustment to it right so this we don't want to forget so it's only for half of the year so we'll say multiplied by 0 0.5 plus the third term in the numerator third term in the numerator RFR in this instance that's 10 percentage again adjusted for time period so we'll say into 0.5 all right so that's the numerator setup let's do the denominator setup now so divided by Sigma let's look at what Sigma is Sigma here happens to be 30 percentage multiplied with under root 0.5 Look at this, when I multiplied with the variance, I multiplied with 0.5, right, the time period. But when I'm multiplying with sigma, I'll have to scale it, right, the under root rule, I'll have to multiply it with under root 0.5. So that gives me the D1. Now, once I have the D1, and in fact, what we'll do is we'll try and solve this now. So I'll do this on the calculator, then we'll kind of write a formula together. So just give me a minute with this. All right, so I have the calculator ready. Let's start, let's start doing it together. So what do we have here? So we have 140 divided by 100. Take a natural log of it, ln, uh, store in the first memory slot. Then 30 percentage x square divided by two multiplied with 0.5 store it in the second memory slot then 10 percentage into 0.5 equal to store it in the third memory slot then I'll also do the denominator at the same time 30 percentage into 0.5 under root equal to store it in the fourth memory slot so let's do the numerator together RCL 1 plus RCL 2 plus RCL 3 uh, so numerator to me is coming out to be 0 0.40 divided by RCL4 denominator is 0 0.21 so I'm getting the D1 value as as 1.9279 so I'm just going to round it off to 1.93 okay so my D1 is coming out in fact let's do a few more decimals 1 to 1.9279 all right there you go that's your value of D1 now once I have the D1 can I go and find out D2 of course yes it's easier I hope you remember the formula so D2 is equal to D1 minus the Sigma into root T right that's your formula so we already have the D1 D1 is 1.9279 we do have the D2 because that was nothing but the denominator of the previous term right so that's 30 percentage multiplied with under root 0 0.5 
right so let's see how much is that so rcl1 this number 1.9279 minus rcl4 which is already my denominator so the number that i'm getting here is 1.715555558 578 so i'm just going to make it as 58 all right so i have values of d1 and d2 available with me now once I have values of D1 and D2, how can I get uh, the how can I get the probability? So here's how you want to want to think of it. By the way, see this is your normal distribution, right? So what what is your job here? Your job here is to figure out uh, what is the probability on the left of 1.9279. So if this is zero, which is the mean of your standard normal distribution, your 1.92 will come in somewhere here, right? So the job is to figure out what is the probability on the on the cumulative probability on the left of 1.9279. This is the region you're looking at, right? This particular probability. Okay. Now there are multiple ways of doing it. If you, you can go to ready-made Z tables, look for probability. Now, just in the interest of time, I'm simply going to use a, a straightforward Excel function and get the values quickly. All right. So N D one is what we need to figure out and nd2 these are d1 d2 we need to figure out nd1 and we need to figure out nd2 so let's do it so i'm going to make use of let's zoom this a little bit okay so i'm going to make use of a function let's say norms dist norms test and all that i need to do is i need to insert the z value in norms test so the first z value first z value which is the d1 value is 1.1.9 1 1.9279 okay so norms test 1.9279 and there you go the first the ND1 is available to us, which is nothing but 97 percentage. Look at the formula one more time. It is simply norms dist, norms for standard normal distribution. And we put in the put in the value here. All right, that's it. Now, of course, I, we can also think of it as percentage. Right, so we can say that the the area under the curve on the left of it on a cumulative basis. What do you mean by left of it? On the left of 1.9279 is roughly about 97 percentage. Okay, now let's look at ND2. So ND2 will use the same formula. So we'll say is equal to norms dist, norms dist, and what's the Z value? 1.7158. 1.7158. There you go. So this is coming out to be 95.69 percentage. So these two values are ready for us now. Let me just assign them some color. So we have ND1 and ND2 available. What do we need to do now? Once we have ND1 and ND2, then we need to go and put those ND1 and ND2 into the equation so that we can get the get the value of call option. So let, let's go and do that. So E is equal to 140 multiplied with the ND1, which came out to be 97.31 percentage so in 140 into 97.31 percentage minus the strike rate was 100 so 100 into e raised to minus 10 percentage into 0.5 minus 10 percentage into 0.5 into nd2 and nd2 probability came out to be 95.69 percentage right so 95 point 95 point 95 point 69 percentage so there you go your equation is set up okay now we need to solve for this and we'll get the answer of course i could have done this on excel much more faster but i wanted to do it you know by writing it slowly slowly step by step so you understand you know what happens when we write formula in excel okay so let's do it let's do it together 
140 into 0 0.9731 STO1 then I'll, I'm going to solve for the bond first with the exponent term so 10 percentage into 0 0.5 make it negative second e raised to x okay so that's your present value factor multiplied with 100 multiplied with 0.9569 right 95.69 is 0 0.9569 We'll put that in the second memory slot. RCL1 minus RCL2, the value of the option is coming out to be 45, 45.21. 45.21. There you go. That's your simplistic uh, model of Black and Scholes. Okay. Now, again, it looks fancy, but it's it's a fairly intuitive, fairly straightforward formula. In fact, if you look at some of my basic videos on derivative, this part of the formula, right? If you just ignore ND1 and ND2, and if you just focus on, just focus on S minus present value of X, this is actually a lower bound of the option price. So there's a very strong inbuilt, there's a strong inbuilt intuition built on Black and Scholes, all right? And this is how the formula gets applied. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take the same data okay and this time around we'll uh, put this into an excel file uh, in such a way that later on when you want to use bsm on different situation you'd be able to recycle the same formulas that we've written multiple times okay so let's create let's create that in an excel file so we'll call it as bsm excel formula Alright, we haven't reached mental model yet, but once this part is done, we should be good to go. And we'll be able to use the same uh, Excel file to same formula that we're writing now to learn the mental model. Alright. So, by the way, in the context of agenda, we have still on point number two. We're still learning the Excel formula integration here. Okay. So, these would be the inputs into the model right we'll have to put certain level of inputs first we'll have to enter a spot price here so in this example i kept it as 140 then we will need the, the strike price in this example in this example that was 100 am i getting the numbers correct spot price 140 100 then we will need the annualized risk free rate of return uh, 10 percentage we will need annualized volatility or sigma in this example that was 30 percentage and time to expiry time to expiry in this example that was 0.5 right so every time you want to do some some sort of a valuation all that you need to do is come here and play with the inputs so that you would get the right set of output for yourself all right so this part is done ready and uh, we should be good to go now all right so let's the let's write the formula of d1 now so how would we how would we construct the formula of d1 observe observe this carefully is equal to log normal first let's take the distance between the spot rate and the strike rate just give me a minute guys here okay so log normal distance between the spot and strike so we'll take 140 140 divided by 100 all right so we'll link at the right places so that we can recycle the formula later on what next uh, plus as i told you three terms in the numerator think of them separately so second term is the half of the variance scaled for time period right so let's take the let's take the second term so volatility squared volatility squared right into 0.5 so that's half of the variance volatility squared into 0.5 but this we have to adjust for this time period as well so into b6 so that's your second step third plus plus let's do rfr 10 percentage into time period adjustment 0.5 all right now let's put a bracket to the whole thing to separate this as a numerator so numerator made of three terms log normal of spot by strike plus half of variance 
multiplying by 0.5 is half of variance adjusted for time period plus RFR adjusted for time period divided by sigma multiplied with square root of square root of the time period okay so there you go that is your formula for D1 have I done the formula correctly yeah 1.92 1.92 yeah okay there was a bracket error there is that matching with the number that we calculated yes we got 1.9279 this is 1.9279 all right so good news d1 is out of our way we're comfortable with this let's go and look at let's go and look at the uh, let's do one more number actually let's do something called as uh, a negative d1 and i'll show you where this would be put to use but right now we'll just call it we'll just call it as a negative negative d1 uh, okay so we'll say d1 let's just say let's just say negative d1 let's say d1 into minus 1 okay or a negative d1 now how do you get negative d1 just make this number negative all right let's go to d2 d2 now how do you get how do you get a d2 so d2 would be d1 minus minus sigma into square root of the time period so square root of the time period and this should do the job here we go so that's your d2 let's get a negative d2 so d2 into minus 1 and what would be a negative d2 it would be just simply a negative value of this one okay why am i doing it there's a reason to it all right so we'll see we'll see that very soon so there we go we have d1 uh, we have d2 values available with us now now the beauty of this particular formula set is that it's it is you know reusable what i mean by this is if i change my spot price to 150 the numbers would kind of update themselves automatically all right so this is there now let's calculate let's calculate n d1 okay so we'll calculate nd1 that means getting the value from normal distribution then we'll also do n negative d1 n negative d1 okay n d2 then we will also need n negative d2 n negative d2 so we'll have nd1 and nd2 all right let's do that how will we do it we'll say norms dist norms dist what z value do we need so we need this particular z value and there you go this will automatically get us the values of all the four okay so same formula same formula everywhere so we have nd1 n uh, minus d1 nd2 n minus d2 i've just made these numbers negative again what is this these are simply probability cumulative probability under the standard normal distributions okay the area under the curve now once we have nd1 nd2 and all of these values next step is to find out the value of call option okay and we will also find out the value of put option call option and put option let's do the let's do the call option valuation so is equal to spot price multiplied with nd1 spot price multiplied with nd1 minus the strike price strike price multiplied with we'll have to take the present value right e raised to rt so multiplied with multiplied with exponential negative negative rfr multiplied by whatever is the time period t so this is your value of the bond or the present value of the strike price multiply this with nd2 nd2 and there you go that's the value of the call 45.20 did we get the same valuation yes we got 45.221 all right so we're there now how do you how do you get the uh, value of put option under bsm right we know the formula of call what is the formula of put option so i'll give you an intuitive framework to remember this okay so your call option is like this right call is equal to spot into nd1 minus 
bond the present value of strike i'm just going to call it as bond all right just for simplicity bond into nd2 now if you want put option there are two ways in which you can do it number one the bsm uh, values can be applied in a put call parity framework okay those of you know what put call parity is uh, stock price plus put option is equal to bond plus the the call option so you can insert the value of call from bsm and the other two variables and then you can figure out what is the value of put that's one way to do it but let's say we want to do it directly i'll give you an easy way to remember the formula what you need to do is shift this term here okay and shift this term here all right so you take the bond you take the bond and you multiply that with nd2 but this time around you do n d2 negative and d2 negative okay that's it and then you take the spot price and you multiply with n and this time you make this time you make the same intuition this time you make the d1 negative okay and again it's it's not difficult right the way you want to think of it if you know basic normal distribution if if d1 is here okay so we are looking at this entire probability okay so what is what is a what is a negative d1 so if i take if i take a negative d1 okay a negative d1 we are looking at this probability now the laws of symmetry work the laws of symmetry basically says that this probability should be same as the probability on the right of d1 as well so technically we are looking at either the left hand side of the probability or right hand side it's like will my call option expire in the money or what is the just think of it for simplicity purposes if this is a probability of something happening this is a probability of something not happening right so that's why we're taking that uh, negative d1 all right i hope that's uh, intuitive enough for you so this is your formula for put option now let's apply let's apply that formula so let's come back here in the excel file and let's apply the value of the put option so that should be equal to strike price right multiplied with exponential multiplied with exponential e raised to negative rfr into the time period t negative rfr in, into the time period t multiplied with so this is your first term multiplied with multiplied with n negative d2 so look at n d2 it was 95 percent and n negative d2 is that remaining 5 percent right so the total is 100 it's, it's that it's like that so multiplied with n negative d2 minus the spot price spot price multiplied with n negative d1 if nd1 was approximately if you look at this nd1 is 97.3 so this is 2.7 okay and there you go the value of your put option is coming out to be 0.329 something and that's it this is your black and scholes formula right so next time you want to value an option all that you need to do is you need to come and insert values in you know these areas insert the value of spot strike rfr volatility and you should be able to uh, integrate you should be able to get all these values for yourself now i would also be uploading this excel file in the description of this video so if you want it for references you can always make use of it okay so with this the second part of our agenda is over so so far what have we learned we've learned uh, fundamentals of banks business model and what are the different credit risk evaluation options which are available then we've then we worked on the black and scholes model for option pricing for calls and put and we also learned how to write that formula in microsoft excel which was a fairly straightforward exercise now this is where the technical part of the session will start wherein now in the third part we will learn how to value uh, the equity of a business how to value the equity using the merton model and then after that we will go into debt valuation this is going to be super interesting going forward now all right so let's look at the section three now how to apply Merton model for equity valuation purposes let me just get 
All right, so Melton model. First, we'll do the logic, then we'll get into calculations. In fact, calculations are pretty simple. It's the logic that we want to focus on. Next 10 minutes are critical, uh, which is kind of the core of Melton model. If you understand this, more or less, uh, you know, job is done. This is a business, all right? And we, we're drawing business books. This is equity, that's how you get money. Uh, this is debt, two sources of your capital, all right? So let's say at the beginning, we bring in equity of 100, we bring in debt of, let's say 200, all right? Now you take this money and you deploy that on the asset side. So let's say you have total assets of 300, all right? And then that's how you banish it kind of tallies. So you have, <clears throat> left hand side and right hand side total matching now this value of asset okay is in the Merton model is generally the value of the business right on this side this is referred to as the value of the firm value of firm okay and value of firm going forward I would simply be addressing this number as V this would be addressed as V so value firm here uh, is 300. <clears throat> now this 300, uh, which is the value, this is assumed to be a, a stochastic variable. This is assumed to be a number that keeps on changing. So there's a level of volatility attached to it, right? So it might go up, it might go down. What we want to look at is we want to look at different scenarios, okay, where if the value of the business is reducing, what happens to the value of uh, equity over a period of time? So we'll start building different scenarios here. Let's let's build those scenarios this side. So let's say, let's look at different scenarios of value of business. Okay, so value of the firm, V. And then what would be the payoff given to, what would be the payoff given to the debt, right? And what would be the payoff given to the equity? So payoff, payoff to equity. All right, let's assume a scenario that, uh, you know, value of business drops dramatically. Okay. And from the levels of 300 value of the business becomes 100. So value of the assets have fallen. The value of the business has fallen. The value of the firm has fallen. It has become only 100. Now, how do you allocate that 100 between debt and equity? Who's the first, who has the first claim? obviously the debt will have the first claim right so this entire 100 would be given to the debt and nothing would be given to the equity so equity payoff would be zero make sense let's say that uh, this is 150 then again debt has a claim up to 200 they have the first priority so this would be 150 this would be zero let's say the value of the firm uh, reaches at 200 now the bondholders would be happy right the debt claimants would be happy because they get their entire 200 back equity doesn't get anything zero now these are the scenarios where debt gets the first priority of course debt gets the uh, first priority always but that first priority kind of comes in very handy for them here right Let's look at a scenario where value of the business goes to let us say 350 now it increases this is where the equity kicks in because we don't want to pay more than 200 to the debt so we pay just the 200 and then equity gets equity gets 150 right and these are payoff not the profit payoffs right how much do i get now let's say uh, things turn out to be really really good and value of the firm becomes 600 debt will still get the same 200 but now equity will get 400 look at how equity behavior is right as the value of firm is increasing the payoff to the equity starts increasing significantly if this is thousand if this is thousand this is 200 and this would be 800 so now what mental model suggests is they suggest that you look at this equity and i'm kind of making the the core point of the mental model now so i need all of you guys to be focused just for a few minutes so you get the whole idea of it so payoff of this equity could be thought of like a call option 
that think of this equity like a call option okay fair enough like a call option with what specification so the strike price of this call option which is going to be same as the face value of the debt now what is the face value of the debt in this instance that's 200 okay so strike price here is going to be 200 and this is a call option on what it is a call option on the firm okay you have a long call position that means equity is essentially long call on the firm with a strike price of 200 now think of it from an option world let me give you different scenarios of spot price you have a right to buy at 200 okay let's say the spot price is 100 150 200 100 150 100 150 just a minute guys 100 150 200 uh, 350 notice how I'm just replicating these values right the form value 350 600 and 1000 now let's figure out what would be the payoff on the call option what would be the payoff on the call option okay so I have a right to buy at 200 what underlying asset price in the market 100 will I buy no I will not right doesn't make sense it's an out of the money call option so I don't want to exercise uh, it's an option it's not a forward I don't have to exercise so this would be zero right to buy 200 price in the market 150 will I buy no zero right to buy 200 price in the market 200 like an add the money option it doesn't matter if I exercise or not indifferent zero right to buy at 200 long call price in the market 350 will I buy now absolutely yes it will right it makes sense for me to buy now so here I get a payoff of 150 here I get a payoff of 400 because a 600 worth of asset I can buy it at 200 and here I get a payoff of 800 so this is you know the innovation of the 74 Merton model as I told you earlier the BSM was originally published in 1973 right and the M of BSM Merton took the same formula but he said hey it could this formula could also be applied in the context of equity valuation and later on the same logic will use for PD and LGD estimation so this formula could also be applied for equity valuation because the equity itself is a call option on the uh, underlying firm right now you would say that Utkash why equity payoff is zero why is it not negative because of the limited liability concept when I'm an equity shareholder I invest some money if the business goes up I reap the fruits but if the business goes down I don't have to pay more right so equity by itself is also a asymmetric product and therefore therefore this logic makes perfect sense that we have uh, the equity of a business could be thought of as a call option on the firm so that's the fundamental point right that's what I want to emphasize on so let me rewrite that again for you so equity of a business right if you want to value equity for business that is same as long call long call on firm underlying asset being firm long call on firm with a strike price is equal to the face value of the debt that's the key learning out of the black and Scholes. and therefore if equity is a long call then why can I not apply the the BSM model for valuation of equity right I can and then the same BSM model applied for valuation of equity purposes now becomes the Merton model so it's exactly the same formula if you open GARP curriculum uh, the formula will look different and I'll show you why but it's the same formula you apply the same formula and you would always get the correct answer for equity valuation under the Merton model all right that's the logic uh, on the equity side and I hope this is uh, making sense to you now what we'll do is we'll create uh, an illustration will create an example and we'll see if we can apply the Merton model there all right so let's let's do an example example on Merton equity we are on the equity side all right so let's set up a beautiful example for ourselves let us say we have uh, let us say we have a, a business okay which has uh, which has uh, currently market value of the firm market value of the firm 
let's say is equal to let's put in some random number let us say 1000 now they've issued zero coupon bond and that's in fact one of the requirement of the Melton model that you have a single payoff liability at a single window that means if you have a serial structure where I'm paying some debt in two years five years seven years you cannot apply a plain vanilla metal model you need some improvisation on top of it so a single zero coupon bond okay uh, which has a face value which has a face value of 800 the yield offer on this bond is 10 percentage the yield offered on the bond is 10 percentage and the maturity of the bond the maturity maturity of the bond is going to be maturity is going to be five years all right maturity is going to be five years now if if i know the value of the bond if i know the yield if i know the maturity can i figure out what is the market value of course yes all that i need to do market value of the bond zero coupon bond today all that I need to do is I need to discount this backwards at the rate of 10 percentage for five years right and here I'm going to make use of a continuous compounding process so observe how 800 multiplied with exponential negative 10 percentage into five so market value of the bond now becomes today 485.22 all right so up to this this is our basic data now what is the challenge here challenge here is to figure out and that's that's what makes the model a little theoretical the challenge is we have to figure out what is the market value of the firm correct getting this particular number and that's slightly challenging to figure out but what is even more challenging is to figure out what is the volatility of the value of the firm okay so this firm is thought of as some sort of a tradable asset either the firm by itself is a tradable asset which you know of course in practice doesn't work or if you could build some sort of a portfolio that replicates the value of this asset uh, and then that replicating portfolio is tradable hypothetically uh, this firm should be the market value should be available on a daily basis and then we should be able to capture the volatility let me make that as uh, 30 percentage and this is good enough once we have all this information then we've been asked to calculate what is the value of equity that's the Merton model value of equity using using Merton model value of equity using the Merton model right and think about it that this value of equity using Merton model is not any different at all from valuing the uh, the option the call option using black and Scholes model it's actually the same thing right so look at this carefully I'm going to apply the same black and Scholes model of course we have the formula we can make use of it but just just you know just for the fun of it here is how we'll value the equity so we'll say value of this equity just a minute value of equity equity is to be valued like a call option on the firm so is equal to spot price spot price is what the today's value of the business right spot price into n d1 the same formula minus minus the strike price now what is the strike price here strike price is nothing but the face value of zero coupon bond right so strike price of 800 multiplied with e raised to e raised to minus 10 percentage and we have to take present value for how many years five years right so that's the maturity or expiry of the option so into five multiplied with n d2 that's it there you go that's how you do the valuation okay then the same formula applied again d1 d1 should be and again if you open the GARP curriculum the formula looks different but it's the same formula so don't worry whether you're reading Schweizer's or GARP you'd feel like the formula is written differently but it's actually the same formula okay so log normal spot by strike as I told you earlier three parts in the numerator so half of the variance try to repeat this with me half of the variance adjusted for time period here so adjusted for time period here in this context would be five years we'll plug in the values very soon 
plus RFR again adjusted for time period divided by divided by sigma into root t okay so let's plug in the values in d1 so log normal spot price spot price is the value of the firm today thousand strike price is the face value face value of the of the bond 800 not the current market value mind you current market value of this bond is 8 485 right 800 discounted at 10 percent for five years what we've taken here is the face value 800 plus let's take the volatility 30 percentage so 30 percentage squared divided by 2 into 5 years it's a 5 year expiry bond plus RFR of 10 percentage into 5 years all right divided by the whole thing divided by sigma of 30 percentage multiplied with under root 5 that's it so let's do this on the calculator as I told you we already have the formula in Excel but repeating this in the calculator a few times I think will help just to internalize the formula so thousand thousand divided by 800 log normal STO 1 30 percentage x square divided by 2 into 5 STO 2 10 percentage into 5 STO 3 30 percentage into 5 under root equal to STO 4 RCL 1 plus RCL 2 plus RCL 3 divided by RCL 4 equal to the D1 value that I'm getting is 1.41 let's quickly do D2 as well so D2 would be equal to 1.41 minus 30 percentage minus 30 percentage into under root 5 and this value should come out to be this value should come out to be 0 0.7425 0 0.7425 and then we'll quickly convert them to we'll quickly convert them to ND1 and ND2 values so ND1 I'll have to refer to the normal distribution ND2 again refer to the normal distribution so let's use the formulas here we can always manually go and look them in the tables it's just that we'll you know try and save some time here so norms norms dist norms dist z value the first one is 1.41 1.41 we want the cumulative one so 92 percentage the second one norms dist norms dist the 0 0.7425 0 0.7425 okay and that is 77 percentage let's convert them to percentage terms let's increase the decimals a little bit okay so there we go we have the values ready now these values will go and put in the original equation okay so here so this should be equal to spot of 1000 the value of the firm today multiplied with 92.07 percentage multiplied with 92.07 percentage minus the present value of the strike price we've already done that right the market value of the zero coupon bond today that's 485.22 485.22 okay 485.22 this 485.22 is nothing but 800 into e raised to negative 10 into 5 right it's the same number multiplied with ND2 77 percentage into 77.11 uh, percentage and there you go the value of the equity is ready for us so the value of the equity should be let's do that 1000 into 0 0.9207 minus bracket open 485.22 into 0.7711 and I'm getting a valuation of 546 I'm getting a valuation of 546.54 so there you go this is how you value equity under the Merton model by simply thinking of equity as a call option okay 
now we are going to cross check this with the option pricing uh, calculator that we built right in this particular tab so i'm just going to copy paste i'm just going to copy paste this set and putting that here all right now here only thing that we need to do is we need to change the change the inputs okay so I'm kind of classify them in different color codes it will be easier when you refer it to refer to it later on okay so the spot price should be same as the market value of the firm spot price should be same as market value of the firm strike price should it be the current value of the debt or the face value of the debt it should be the face value of the debt which is 800 RFR is same so let's link this with this maturity let's link this with this and finally we need volatility so this is equal to 30 percent okay so in your black and Scholes calculator all values will now come from this blue boxes so if you want to play around with model metal model you can come and you know put in the numbers here you'll get the answer and the value of the call option is coming out to be 547 which is matching with what valuation we've done maybe we've messed up on few decimals here and there but we have uh, we are almost there okay so this is how uh, where where have we messed up with decimals i think it's uh, 92.12 we've done 92.07 right because of 1.4134 but we are almost there so this is how you apply the metan model for valuation of equity correct right? i hope you've understood this logic now if you'd open the garb curriculum especially for frm part 2 candidates this formula is written little differently right and it's very confusing the way that formula is written and that's actually just a uh, uh, once i spent a few minutes on it i realized that it's just a different mathematical equation that they've used so what they've done is this part of the equation is same okay in the garb curriculum this part of the equation is same but they have rewritten the nd1 d1 formula slightly differently so here is the garp version of the formula okay what they've done is they've taken log normal and of course they write 1 minus 2 but it's easier to write s minus x right so what they've done is they've taken log normal value of the firm which is spot price value of the firm and instead of taking the face value of the debt because remember we took 800 here in the denominator instead of taking face value of the debt they've taken market value of the debt so market value the today's market value of the debt today's market value of the debt okay and obviously when you look at the formula on the face of it it looks like they're doing something else but i'll explain you why they do it then as you know the second term is the variance you take half of that variance right and you adjust that for time period and the third term and the third term which is okay some error with my excel wait a minute guys okay the third term third term which is the rfr you do not have to enter in this particular equation so right so if you just do a little bit of algebraic manipulation instead of adding that rfr separately here what they've done is they simply taken a lower value in the denominator which is again an adjustment of rfr and then they've solved it so when you use market value of the debt in the denominator you don't have to add that rfr separately that's it otherwise everything else is same divided by divided by divided by the sigma into root t sigma into root t okay let me just clear that mess that i've made here plus the third third term which should not be added do not add the third term in this equation okay and uh, we'll just going to quickly experiment with this and see if that really works so log normal market value of the business is 1000 market value of the business is 1000 but this time in the denominator i'm not going to take the face value i'm going to take the market value of the debt which is 485.22 so 4 485.22 
plus we will take the half of the variance so variance would be 30 percent square divided by 2 we will multiply that with 5 and we will not add a third term to the equation and we will say sigma into so sigma should be 30 percent so 30 percentage 30 percentage under root under root 5 all right so let's solve this and if the two values of d1 matches then the job done all right so so 1000 divided by 485.22 log normal sto1 30 percentage x square divided by 2 into 5 sto2 30 percentage into 5 under root equal to sto3 rcl1 plus rcl2 divided by rcl3 I'm getting 1.4134 and 1.1.1.4134 and this value is exactly same as what we calculated here right if you can see this these are exactly the same values so these are the two variations in the formula right and could be a little confusing but now you understand the intuition of why the formula is written in a particular way now if you want to play around the same in the the excel calculator that we have built you can do that so what you can do that is you can say that i will not take the strike prices the face value of the debt i would rather take the strike price as the the market value of zero coupon bond okay and if i do that 485 485 but then I don't have to add RFR separately in the D1 formula, correct? So I'll have to make the RFR as 0. And then if you'd see, the D1 will come out to be exactly the same number, 1.41. But it will not give you the same call option value, okay? Because, you know, you need another layer of compounding here. So it's, so it's always a good idea to use the standard metric that we built. Okay, I mean, you get the D1. Uh, but in this particular excel formula you will not get the correct answer okay so let me just change the numbers and revert back to the original set of numbers have we done that no let me okay this should be 800 this should be 10 percentage and there we go the metal model is ready so this is how the metal model works for the equity valuation purposes and if you've understood this, that's a good news because we've been able to finish the third list on our agenda for the session, applying Merton model for equity valuation. And now in the final leg, we will go to application of Merton model for the debt valuation. Okay, and there are two separate approaches and we would look at uh, each of those approach. So let's get started. First, we'll do the logic, then we'll start doing the mathematics. So, Merton model for debt. All right, so again, uh, should take you about five to ten minutes to get hold of this concept of course it's it's going to be a little tricky so you need to be alert in the previous example we were looking at things from equity perspective now we have to look at things from debt perspective so again we have a business right the the money comes in in the form of money comes in in the form of equity and debt so we did an example of we did an example of equity being 100 debt being equity being 100 debt being 200 and the value of the firm initially being set up as 300 what we said is this total value of the firm is a volatile item so you know this value could go up or go down uh, it could vary now we want to look at the debt perspective okay how do you how do you look at how do you value the debt so here are the three approaches valuation valuation of the debt 
there are two technical approach and one an intuitive approach but let's just say three approach okay first easiest we'll simply say that see uh, value of the form value of the form is equal to value of the form is equal to the uh, the value of equity value of equity right plus value of debt correct so I can always rewrite this equation and I can say that value of debt value sorry this value of debt value of debt is equal to is equal to the value of form correct minus value of equity value of form minus value of equity so that's one way to do the valuation if you know the value of form you know the value of equity you have the value of debt now the same simplistic approach I can take and create a second method out of it where I say you know what we've just learned that this value of equity is nothing but a call option on the form correct in the previous section we learned that value of equity is nothing but a call option on the form so I can take the same equation that value of debt is equal to value of debt is equal to the value of the entire form okay minus the call option call option on the form because in the previous section we were able to establish that value of equity value of equity and uh, is same as the call option on the form right so these two numbers are these two numbers are interlinked with each other and there you go that's your second way of looking at it in fact the second method the first method is nothing but a, uh, a setup to derive the second method all right now what is the third way to handle this so the third way is you can say that see when I'm buying this debt right let's think from a debt holder perspective when things are good I just get the debt back right but things are bad and with, if the value of the firm falls then I have to book losses I have to book losses from by how much value of the firm has fallen because it's not sufficient to cover my debt so what I can think is I can think that instead of thinking instead of thinking that I have a value of a risky debt right so instead of thinking that I have a risky debt what if I think what if I think that I have a long position I have a long position on risk-free bond okay and what is the equivalent value of it is the current market value of that bond current market value of zero coupon bond so I'm going to say that I have a long position I have a long position on risk-free bond which is equal to current market value and if things are okay if things are okay this is what I am going to earn but if things go wrong then of course I book losses so what I have along with this is I also have I have a short position I have a short position on what I have a short position on put option I have a short position on put option now what is the strike price of put option strike price of that put option is equal to face value of zero coupon bond and what is the underlying asset the underlying asset underlying asset is firm okay of course now this is a slightly difficult for people to comprehend and help you understand this with the help of an example so underlying asset is nothing but underlying asset is nothing but the firm okay and it's a put option I have a short position so this is the third method now let me create some examples so you'll understand how the third method works so uh, in the context of this example okay equity debt equity debt and the and the value of the firm right so let's create different scenarios so these are the scenarios for scenarios for value of firm value of firm okay scenarios for value of firm and then we'll look at what would be the payoff okay what would be the payoff to the to the debt now let's say the value of the firm is zero or hundred or 100 
or 150 or 400 let's increase it or let's say 500 or let's say 1000 different scenarios okay now as a bondholder my face value of my debt is 200 so on expiry what will I get so on expiry if the value of the firm is 0 I get 0 right because the firm is bankrupt if the value of firm is 100 I claim the entire 100 so I get the whole 100 equity will not get anything if the value is firm is 150 I get the whole 150 correct if the value of the firm is 400 do I get 400 no because my debt is up to 200 right so market value let it increase I am just happy that I get my 200 back correct here I am just happy that I get my 200 back so you don't have the upside here right I am just happy that I get the 200 back that's it so when the things are good you get the whole 200 back when the things are bad you get whatever is the value of the firm now let's do this an option analogy now okay so let's think of this as some sort of an option analogy let us say that you have a long position on you have long position on some bond you have long position on some bond which on expiry which on expiry is going to give you 200 okay at the same time you have a short position you have a short position on a put option on some on some firm now it's actually stock but let's say you have short position on some firm uh, with a strike price equal to 200 okay and then we will do different scenarios of different scenarios of value so let's do let's do scenarios of firm value scenarios of firm value firm value okay so again I'm going to replicate the scenario just to help you appreciate how the payoffs are similar so 0 100 150 0 100 150 200 to sorry 400 400 500 and 1000 and 1000 all right so these are the different scenarios now I have two positions right what do I have I have a long bond I have a long bond and I have a short put correct the total of these two would be my payoff so we'll create a third column which will be total payoff now how much will long bond give me long bond will always give me 200 because it's a zero coupon bond right and it's a it's a RFR type of a bond so you have long position you have a long position on RFR bond which current market value which is the current market value zero coupon bond right so on expiry it gives me the face value in each of the scenario I get 200 in each of the scenario I get 200 okay 200 200 200 one two three two hundred two hundred two hundred so that's a good news we get a assured 200 on this long one let's look at short put what does short put means short put means I have an obligation to buy is that a right no it's an obligation so I will buy only when the value of the asset has fallen below 200 I will have to book those losses right if the value of the asset goes below 200 I will have to buy them at a higher price so when value of the asset has fallen to two fallen to zero will I have to buy 200 yes it's a short put remember not long put I don't have a right I have an obligation so I have an obligation to buy at 200 price in the market zero will they force me to buy yes so how much will I lose I will lose 200 what's my total payoff total payoff zero okay again I have a obligation to buy at 200 price in the market 100 will they force me to buy yes so how much do I lose here 100 what's my net payoff 200 minus 100 plus 100 obligation to buy at 250 so this is minus 50 I get 150 here obligation to buy at 200 price in the market 400 right the put option is out of the money I don't have any obligation at all because who would force me to buy at 200 when the price in the market is 400 so out of the money out of the money out of the money so here I keep the whole bond payoff 200 200 200 right so look at this that what was the debt payoff when we saw that here 
the debt payoff was look at this column zero in the first scenario here debt payoff is zero in the first scenario look at these two payoffs zero zero debt payoff was 100 here right debt payoff is debt payoff is 100 i i made a yeah 100 100 look at this 100 100 third here payoff is 150 here payoff is 150 right the numbers are matching here payoff is 200 here payoff is 200 and then we have 200 for all the remaining three scenario because i get the entire payoff because the value of firm has gone up right so that's your second or third depending on how you look at it way of valuing the debt that value of a risky debt is equal to long rfr plus short position on the put option that's one way to do it or value of the firm minus the value of the call option that's the second way to do it okay now can we do an example on this of course yes so let's do an illustration on this so let's do an illustration so Merton debt illustration let's uh, take the number from our equity model we'll take the same numbers no it'll be easier for us to do it that way let's take numbers from the equity model by the way this excel file will be available for download in the description of this video or on the Fintry LMS page so that if you want to play around you can always do that okay the file has become very heavy so it's lagging now let me try and restart it okay should work now All right, Merton model debt illustration. Let's post these numbers. Same example, and we'll try and value the debt. All right, here we go. All the data is ready now. All right, so let's focus on these data points. Same business. Uh, we have the the zero coupon bond face value we have the current market value of the uh, zero coupon bond or instead of saying market value the current value of the zero maybe market is a incorrect word here the correct value of the zero coupon bond which is the present value of future cash flow uh, the volatility of the firm on so on and so forth right what is our job job is to figure out the true market value of this debt right so this is the value in my box which is the current present value but what's the true market value so how can we do it so we can do it using the the two approaches under the Merton model right so we'll do them here so observe Merton model debt Merton model debt first model first model debt is equal to value of firm so I'm just let me just call it as V minus minus the value of equity which is nothing but the call option right so value of the business minus the call option what is the value of business here value of the business is 1000 so 1000 minus what is the value of call option the value of call option is 547.05 so 547.05 okay so let's figure out how much is this value I'll use a we'll use a formula here so e is equal to is equal to the value of the business minus minus the call option value which is coming out to be 452 right that's one way to look at the value of the debt I hope this is making sense okay so this is your value of the debt 452 all right now what is the second way to do it second way to do it is you would say that instead I would say that I have a long position on RFR and what is the RFR of this what is the value of this RFR which is equal to the the present value of zero coupon bond 
okay so i have long position on this and minus a put option because i have a short position right so minus a put option put option on the firm okay now do we have these numbers available yes what is the long position what is the value of this zero coupon bond 485.22 so 485.22 minus do we have the value of the put option because it's a short position right so it should be minus yes the value of the put option is 32.28 so 32.28 and let's see what answer we get so e is equal to e is equal to the value of the debt minus minus the value of the put option and look at the number that you've got let me highlight this for you a little bit look at the number that you've got it is exactly same as this one in fact we can do a quick test on it uh, whether this is equal to this we get the true so these are two ways in which you can value you can value the metal model value the debt under the metal model all right so the four sections are over there's a small small bonus session for you uh, this now small 10 minute session for frm part 2 candidates because there there could be some potential theory question on this all right so i hope this part is clear to you guys so i can build some more intuition on this now think about it so i'm going to build on to this equation the value of debt okay this will not take more time but you you'd enjoy this part this is very beautiful value of debt is equal to the value of firm okay minus the the value of call option correct now think about it that if the value of the firm increases by 1 okay value of the firm is nothing but underlying asset so what do you think call option will increase by how much call option will increase by the delta value correct that's what delta means that's what delta means right the delta means that one increase in underlying one one dollar increase in underlying will result into delta dollars increase in the value of the business so value of the debt will increase by one minus delta one minus delta so every one dollar increase every one dollar increase in the value of the firm the value of equity will increase by dollar delta and value of the debt will increase by one minus dollar delta okay now we can we can see if that works in practice all right so what is the value of the firm right now so let's say value of the firm increases by one what is the current delta the current delta is nothing but nd1 right so what is the nd1 it is 0 0.9212 okay what is point point nine two one two so the call option will increase by 0 0.9212 so by how much will the debt value increase so debt value will increase by 1 minus 0 0.9212 0 0.9212 so that's giving us 0 0.0 0 0.0788 so for every one dollar increase in the value of the firm the value of the debt will increase by 0 0.0788 0 so which means if I were to come and increase the value of the firm by one, okay. So if I if I were to make this instead of thousand, if I were to make this as thousand and one, the value of the debt of the business will increase by the value of the debt of the business will increase by zero point zero seven. So four fifty two point nine whatever decimal after that is there, it will increase by point zero point zero seven after that, right? Now you can play around. I'm going to share this file on the description, so you can always do that. But I'll show you how. So 101 and uh, maybe a few more decimals will be helpful. Okay, so earlier at 1000, earlier at 1000, the value was 452.94. If I add 0 0.07, it should go to 453.01 or something like that, right? So let's make 1001 and there you go, 453.01, right? So hopefully this serves as a solid base for uh, understanding how to use Metal model for equity valuation and debt valuation. 
in the next part of the video which would be on Fintry LMS I would be discussing how to make use of Melton model for forecasting the the probability of default as well as the loss given default which is an equally interesting and numerically intensive area so with this thank you very much appreciate uh, for you staying till the end if you're still watching uh, and I hope you benefited and enjoyed from the video thank you very much